Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Answers from the Lab, where we share Mayo Clinic knowledge and advancements on the state of testing and science from laboratory leaders and the people who are making it happen behind the scenes. I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, Interim Chair of the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. With me today is Dr. Bill Maurice, the President and CEO of Mayo Clinic Laboratories. Hi, Bill. Welcome back. Yeah, thanks. It's uh, it's it's good to be back. Yeah, it's been a while since we've last talked. A lot of things have been happening, too. Yeah, the world has not stopped turning, even though we have been not been able to get together and talk. <laughs> yeah, well, I thought this would be a great time for us to update uh, the folks listening and watching to uh, on some important topics, some uh, infectious diseases in my wheelhouse and yours, of course, as well. But then also what's going on with FDA and and some updates in that area. It sounds, yeah, like you said, lots to talk about. Yeah, well, maybe we should start with uh, talking about something we know a good amount about, and then we can kind of move into the things that are maybe a bit uncertain. Um, measles. Dr. Binninger and I uh, had recorded a podcast just a little while ago on measles, and now we're continuing to hear this in the news. There was an individual that was proven to have measles that boarded a flight from, uh, it was from Munich to Los Angeles International on Lufthansa, I'm probably saying that incorrectly, uh, and then boarded a connecting flight. And as we've talked about before, measles is one of the most infectious diseases we know. It's spread by air, it's airborne. Uh, you can catch it within two hours of contact with an infected individual. So, you know, this is, this is something we're continuing to see now. We had eliminated measles from the United States. In fact, in 2000 is when we got the elimination status, but we've had 10 outbreaks in 2024 already and 142 cases in 21 states. And most of this is and I should say there is a vaccine and most of these cases are in non-vaccinated or unknown vaccination status individuals. So it really just goes to show the importance of vaccination and then also in public health and tracking down all these cases, notifying people that may be exposed, getting them vaccinated and, and making sure they receive care. Yeah, well, it isn't, um, it did take, the, the news has taken me back to the, to the debates around COVID and is COVID truly... Yeah. Really airborne or not and i remember measles was one of the examples of those of of a uh, respiratory virus that can be transmitted through the airborne route meaning it can Absolutely. really be you know which is of course why it's concerned on an airplane because i know the airplane industry airline industry travel industry as a whole has done a whole lot to in terms of safety and and preventing transmission of illness but still this is just so both transmissible and i think it's um you know the likelihood of of it's it's is pretty high if you're exposed, of, if you're unvaccinated, of, of, of actually acquiring the disease as well. Yeah, and the thing is, is we think of measles and we think of this rash-like illness, but people are infectious several days before they have the rash. So they may just have a little bit of a cough, maybe a mild fever, maybe a little bit of pink eye, conjunctivitis, um, then they get the rash, but they're infectious that whole time. And the airline industry has done a great job in making it safe to fly, but there are still certain people, like if you're sitting directly next to a person who's coughing, you are at increased risk. So yeah. the CD is looking into that. Um, another thing I'll just mention is that measles is not just a rash illness with a bit of a fever and a cough. It can cause pneumonia. It can cause an acute encephalitis. And then there's this very scary complication called subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, SSPE, that can occur years even decades after, like up to several decades, but the average is about seven years and there's no cure. It's always fatal. So we shouldn't think of measles as just like a rash febrile illness. It can be very serious for a lot of people. That's so right. Vaccination is important. Yeah, absolutely. And one question that's come up to me is, do I need to, is it the type of vaccination that needs a booster? And that I, I'm just not quite, I think you typically it has long lasting, an MMR vaccine has long lasting protective effects is my understanding, yeah. but you should check with your provider if you have Absolutely. concerns. 
Right. There is a schedule to it where you get certain uh, you get certain uh, vaccination schedules like early on and then later in life. But yeah. it's pretty long lasting and pretty well protective. You can get breakthrough cases, but it is a very good vaccine. Very safe. It's been in use for a very long time. So yep. that's measles. That's um, measles. So get vaccinated, make sure your kids are vaccinated or other people in your life are vaccinated. And um, now a little bit more of an unknown bird flu. Yeah. Uh, another topic that you and I have talked about, Dr. Binniger and I have talked about, he's a popular guy with all of our viruses that are circulating. And um, so just taking everyone back, it was 2020 when we had this what I would say explosive spread of this new strain of H5N1, commonly called bird flu. That was, uh, again, it merged in 2020, but what's been really worrisome about it is it has just caused unprecedented numbers of deaths in wild birds, domestic poultry, and then it's been infecting multiple mammal species. And now what we're hearing about in the news are the cattle, especially dairy cattle. Um, I will say just quickly though, don't worry about your milk. Milk is pasteurized, so it is safe to drink. And just to be on the safe side, anyone that detects H5N1 in their cows is supposed to be destroying their milk. But still, the people that are around the dairy cattle can get infected. And we've now just had our third case of human transmission. So no need to panic yet, but the CDC and other healthcare organizations are starting to take steps to prepare for a possible outbreak should the virus actually mutate and become more transmissible from human to human. Right now, it's not. It's just yep. humans that are exposed to poultry and exposed to cattle, veterinarians, and, and wildlife. Yeah. So there's there's been in the news um, a few vaccines. So the U.S. is manufacturing close to 5 million doses of an existing vaccine for H5N1, which is very close, although not exact to the current circulating strain. And they're considering in the U.S. and Europe whether to vaccinate workers like poultry and dairy workers, veterinarians, lab techs. But now the big news is that the U.S. government's also working with Moderna and Pfizer, uh, Moderna in actually uh, specifically has an mRNA bird flu vaccine that they would be uh, doing late stage trials, perhaps with government funding, and it would cover the H5N1 variant as well as other strains. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, again, it's something that people hadn't really thought about in terms of animal to human transmission of these viruses. I know it came up, you know, people were surprised during COVID, there was, I think, the you know, an example of a mink farm, I think, in Northern yeah. Europe or Denmark, and then concerns that maybe the Omicron strain actually had been in, in a non-human species and because it was so different than the circulating. Mm -hmm. So it's something that's been around, and I think people like Dr. Binnaker, who, just to be clear, is popular with people because of his knowledge <laughs> of viruses, not necessarily popular with viruses who he tries mm -hmm. to, which he tries to fight, but, uh, yeah, right, but right. you know, but this, the, the whole concept of, of, of animals as a reservoir for, for these infections, it's something that we, we've known about for a long time, but I think you know, people are now just much more aware of after COVID just be, because of COVID and then the impact that it had. So uh, it's good to know that, the government's working on it's good to know that some of the the infrastructure and capabilities like an mrna vaccine that came about during the pandemic are now being used for other pathogen outbreaks is really gratifying to see um the one thing which we haven't seen um which is a little disheartening is actually reauthors repassage of the of the pandemics and all hazard preparedness act or papa yeah. which a lot of people don't probably Everyone wants to forget COVID, but don't realize that's a, there actually is 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 a bill that enabled a lot of things that we did during COVID, like the rapid standing up of testing, working with the public health labs, all those sorts of things were because this was in place. Now there's been complacency about getting it. it, it it's expired and getting it reactivated. So a uh, uh, repassed. So I think it's another thing for us to think about as a laboratory community. You know, these it's an area for advocacy because it actually gave us the ability to do a lot of things we were asked to do and needed to do in response to COVID. And as much as none of us want something like COVID to happen again, just like this is, you know, the world, it, just like, again, they, this H5N1 is telling us that it's not, the, unfortunately, the last time we're going to have to deal with this. So we yeah. need to be prepared. 
I agree completely. And I think that's important, uh, this connection to laboratory medicine. We hear about these outbreaks, measles, H5N1, the implications for human medicine. We have to respond as the laboratory and we can pull together when need be, but we need that infrastructure, which is why it's helpful to have the support of regulation. Uh, we need the tests. We need to start thinking about that. A lot of laboratories, including my own, are thinking about what we would do if we had to start testing for H5N1 specifically. The good news is that most of the influenza PCR tests that are out there probably will detect it. It just won't differentiate it specifically, but that may be necessary if it's in a flu season with other flu strains circulating. So it's good for us all to kind of just keep an eye on what's going on, but then also to have those preparedness plans. That's right. And the other thing is, and going back to measles, is a couple of important things. Number one, you mentioned we had reached eradication in the U.S. Yeah. We hadn't. We have not across the globe. No. And it's still, if you look at the numbers, it's it is a lethal disease. And when we went think, back to back to COVID, we're looking at COVID deaths. There's a number, a significant number of measles deaths across the globe every yes. year. So that's why there's a concern. It's not just about a rash. And the other thing that's really scary with it is it really, you have the encephalitis, which you mentioned, which can be fatal, but it really heavily impacts children, you know? Yes. And so we, I mean, you think about protecting our most precious resource, which is our, our, our kids, right? So yeah. um, just again, maintaining the structures allow us to respond. And as a medical community, maintaining the awareness and the vigilance that we have to say, you know, to say that, we live in a very connected world and we have to really think about the best way to protect not just ourselves, but our fellows, you know, our fellow humans here on the globe. Yes, especially the little humans, but all the humans. Yes. All the humans. <laughs> well, you know, this really ties into our third topic now, which is lab developed tests, because, of course, a lot of these tests for emerging pathogens are going to be lab developed tests. And do you want to give us a little bit of uh, oversight then on what the FDA regulation, what's new in the area? Yeah, well, so of course we had our our our, our special event podcast mm -hmm. when that when the final rule was published by the FDA, right. uh, in which the FDA asserted that laboratory developed tests are medical devices mm -hmm. and therefore subject to the uh, you know, Food and Drug Cosmetics Acts, which was passed. I believe in the in the nineteen seventies, a number of years ago, decades ago. Um, so that came out as you and I discussed. There was a number of in, quote enforcement discretions that that FDA was going to continue to to um, to, to to be discreet about. I guess yeah. you know it's not, but essentially. Um, that and so and we've all had time to digest that in the in the laboratory community, including the American Clinical Laboratory Association, which is a trade association which represents clinical laboratories in and and in, in our issues in DC. Um, on reviewing of the final rule, the ACLA, the American Clinical Laboratory Association, the big news this week was they decided to challenge in the courts yes. um, their the the um, validity of FDA. Uh, oversight of LDTs, you know, particularly around the the assertion that 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 tests are medical devices. Because if you look at a medical device, it's really something designed by a manufacturer with performance characteristics that they then package and sell by interstate commerce. As a laboratorian, that's not how I, I think about the tests that I develop and run in my lab. Right. Right. I think about them as a as a as a trained medical professional went to graduate school, medical school, residency training, um, subspecialty training. And taking all that and creating a diagnostic service with all the other professionals in the lab, um, of the allied health staff and others, right? So it really is a service that, and that as such, then it really is not subject to, um, you know, it shouldn't be thought of as a medical device. And that becomes really important because if you step back and think about it, um, if all those things that are enforcement discretions in the final rule that was were put out are just that, they're only, they're really just, it, it creates actually more uncertainty for all of us as laboratorians because it's just they could choose at any time. And I think we discussed this last time to, to the FDA gauge could say, well, you know, we're not going to exhibit enforcement discretion on this now or on that now. And so if we all concede that lab tests, lab developed tests are medical devices, which I honestly don't think is a, is, is a very defensible position. So that's why it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Yeah. Um, you know, will now play out in the courts. Uh, there's been a lot of Court trials, which I won't mention specifically, which have been getting <laughs> a lot of 
press attention, a lot more press attention than this one. Um, but that's but that's the latest news there. We'll have to see. And and AC, American Clinical Lab Association is the first. It may not be the last that actually challenges right. the, this this in the in the courts. Yeah, I agree. I guess one important point for everyone listening is that you should continue planning. Uh, there's no guarantee that any of this is going to have any type of outcome that we would expect or could even really anticipate. Um, and it could very well be that the FDA rules, they still are in place. So you still, everyone should still continue planning on how they're going to uh, comply with these new regulations. Absolutely. It's still the law of the land. I mean, that's one yep. question that's come to me since I am the chair of the ACLA board of, you know, is does that mean now that that we can pause and no, but no. that mean to get for that to happen, someone would have to ask for what's called a preliminary injunction, meaning they have to ask the court to actually step in front and say we can't, we have to pause this until we have time to consider this from a legal perspective. That wasn't part of the ACLA lawsuit, or and and okay. that's the only one filed so far. So until that happens, or if that and let if if that happens, then yes, it would pause. To your point, it hasn't happened, and therefore. As soon as of May 6th, that's the law of the land, which we have to be prepared to comply in the phased approach that's laid out in that in that final rule. Yeah. Mayo included. Yeah, absolutely. That's what we're doing. Still planning, looking ahead, but seeing where all yep. of this goes. And we will keep everyone up to date on all of these topics. Yes, indeed. Yeah. The, like, uh, I don't think there's going to be any shortage of news for us to discuss in the near Never. future. Never. Never, never. <laughs> All right, Belle. Well, thanks. It's always great talking to you and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Yeah, it's fun to catch up. Yep. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for tuning in to Answers from the Lab. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to tune in every Thursday and every other Tuesday. <laughs>